Christian revenge. Two words that really, they, no matter how you slice it and dice it, they don't go together. Now, justice, that's a different matter. But we kind of equate the two, revenge and avenge. And you know, a lot of movies today are all about revenge. And we, we, we side with this sense of injustice that was done. You know, whether it's movies like this, then we have a whole army of avengers that are bringing about justice and revenge. Or some of these other movies, I haven't seen John Wick, but I'm told they killed his dog, and so he kills them all. Revenge. Or, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. Right. Right, and that's all about revenge. I mean, that's, that's kind of a funny movie from decades ago, but revenge, it's a common theme. It's actually a lot of movies. I, I was, as I was preparing this message, I was like, wow, we, we like a revenge story. The idea that something went wrong and they're going to get it. Because there's, a, there's this sense of justice in us that it's got to get dealt with. It's not fair. It's not right. There's a lot of things in life that just aren't right. Well, if you've been with us over the last few um, couple months, actually, we've been in the book of Judges, and we're coming to the end here, and we've been dealing with Samson. And Samson, we looked at last week, he, he, has, he was a Nazarite, right? He wasn't supposed to touch the grapes, he wasn't supposed to cut his hair, and he wasn't supposed to touch dead things. And yet he's flirting with all of those and doing all of those. He's, he's supposed to be dedicated to God, he's supposed to be loving God and following God's word, and instead he's kind of like, well, I got these three that I'm following and the others don't matter. And so he wants to marry a Philistine wife, right? And remember, he, he saw her because he looked, she looked good in his eyes. It was what was right in his eyes. We pick it up in Judges 15, verse 1. Remember that he had just married her, and yet they had been this thing back and forth um, with the, the wager and the, the, the riddle. And finally, they outsmart him, or they basically force his wife into telling the riddle and so then he has to go and, and get 30, you know, he kills 30 guys to give them the, the clothes that they're supposed to get. So, and then he leaves. Well, Judges 15, 1. After some days, at the time of the wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go into my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. Her father said, I really thought you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Uh, is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please, please, take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines when I do them harm. So the story, he left. He didn't, you know, the wedding, the wedding celebration went on for seven days. They, Mr. and Mrs. enjoy it. And yet this thing happens at the end. He's frustrated. He leaves. He leaves his wife and doesn't know that his wife is now given to the best man. It's like they think that She's, he's, he's gone. And he finally says, okay, I'm going to go back. And he goes back and he finds out that she's gone. She's been given away. And now he's like, oh, those Philistines. The first time he killed the 30 people and they really did nothing wrong. Remember those 30 guys that died to, just to pay for the clothes of the other Philistines. This time he says, now I am innocent. I know that what I did that last time was a little bit shady, but this time I'm, I'm going to be innocent in what I do to them to get them back. Let's see what he does. Judges 15, verse 4. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches. And he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set fire to the torches, he let the foxes go into the standing grain of the Philistines and set fire to the stacked grain and the standing grain, as well as the olive orchards. Okay, you have to understand, this is basically, you know, the standing grain is the grain that's in the field, the stacked grain is the grain that's been harvested. Basically, he set these 300 foxes and they're burning up all this countryside. It's basically like somebody going in and wiping out your bank account, your 401k, and all these things. And it wasn't just yours, it was a whole bunch of people's. Now, now, what, now remind me again, what did they do to Samson? They took his wife. Yeah, 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 justice, right? Yeah. Justice. We have this idea, well, well, you know, what they did was wrong, and so, and in Samson's eyes, he's right because they did him wrong. 
And so often in the scriptures, um, there was this sense of, well, it's right to get back. If somebody's harmed you, it's right to get them back. Even in the Torah, in Leviticus 24, um, we see this idea of if anyone injures his neighbor, he has it done, it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he was given, a person shall be given to him. This, although it doesn't sound like it on the surface, is actually mercy. Because the attitude in those cultures was, if you do me wrong, you hurt me, I'm going to hurt your whole family. The idea that if you, if you, you, you wound me by 10, I'm going to wound you by 100. The scriptures here say, no, 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 eye for eye, tooth for tooth, fracture for fracture. If they do you wrong, then the same back to them. That's just, this was God's justice. This was God's mercy. And yet, even Samson, we see it over and over in the scriptures, this idea of revenge. And it's always way more. Somebody gets revenge then revenge, and it just keeps going bigger and bigger. It's never meted out equally. And our world is full of injustices. And so because our world being full of injustices, there is a sense, yeah, it's, it's right to be angry. You know, as a Christian, as a, as a young Christian and being raised in the Lord and, and reading the Bible, at one point I, I thought that it was wrong to be angry because Christ, Christians don't get angry. Right? If you're a good Christian, you're not going to get angry because, because you know, just you know, the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. James 1.20, right? But notice that verse, James 1.19, before it. Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. So it's it says he actually is giving you permission to get angry. He says, do it slowly. But recognize the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. So those of you that are hot-headed with a, a short fuse, you're already in sin. In fact, Ephesians 4.26, be angry. Hey, for those of you that have always been wondering, now you've got permission. Be angry. <laughs> Paul tells you, it's okay, be angry, but do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. What in the world does that mean? In other words, anger is a righteous thing. It's righteous to say that this was wrong. But then what do you do with it? If you dwell on it and chew on it, as a person, as a human, it begins to permeate. Now we've just crossed that line from anger and we're into sin. And it says, do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. In other words, the more days you think about it, the deeper it goes, the deeper the bitterness goes. And it says, give no opportunity for the devil. That word opportunity, we've talked about it before. It's tapas, which means place. We get topography, uh, the word from it. In other words, don't give place. Don't give the enemy any real estate in your head. If you chew on anger and you think about revenge, and you think about, I should have said this. The result is you're giving the devil just a little bit of real estate. And you're saying, you can live there rent-free. And the thing is, when he lives there rent-free, he's a squatter, and he doesn't just satisfy with that little bit. He just begins to permeate more and more until we become consumed in that, I'm owed this. What they did to me, I'm owed it. It's okay because God understands, right? That's, that was Samson's mentality. Samson's revenge was, God understands. They did me wrong. It's okay for me to do them wrong. In the scriptures, over and over again, uh, one of the, the first murder, of course, was Cain, right? Cain murdered his brother Abel. And Cain says, oh, my, you know, you're, you're basically, you're cursed from the, the land, and the land's not going to give you harvest anymore. And so Cain is like, he doesn't actually say forgive me, which is kind of interesting. He just says, my curse is too much to bear. And then God places a mark on him basically saying, hey, um, if anybody hurts you, Seven times will be the punishment for the other person. It's like this warning. And then Lamech, a couple grandsons later, basically says, well, if Cain was avenged... Oh, wait, wait, you got to read it. You got to read it, because this is, this is funny. Not funny, but, it, but it's, it's interesting, because here it is. Uh, Genesis 4.23. 420, uh, I have killed a man for wounding me. Okay, notice, notice just that very beginning. I've killed a man because he wounded me. He hurt me, so I killed him. Justice, right? Not even close. A young man for striking me. If Cain's revenge is sevenfold, then Lamech's is seventy-sevenfold. This whole idea, revenge is, is never satisfied with equality. 
Even justice does not satisfy. Revenge is to get more. It's in other words, I was innocent. You hurt me. Therefore, you're guilty, so I can hurt you back, and then I need to do more to teach you a lesson. That's the sense of justice that we have. I'm glad God doesn't have that sense of justice. God has justice, but not like that. Another example in the scriptures, in, in um, Genesis 34. Do you remember what happened to, to Dinah? Remember the, the 12 tribes, the 12 brothers of Israel? The 12 sons of Israel became the, the, the 12 tribes, but they had, a daughter, they, had a, they had a sister, and her name was Dinah. And what happened to Dinah? She was raped by Shechem. And so Simeon and Levi said, it's not right that our daughter be raped. They devised a plan, basically saying, hey, you know what? We can have our, our daughters marry your sons, but you've got to get circumcised. And so he basically they tricked them all into all getting circumcised. And on the second day, when they're in the most pain, they killed all the men. She was raped. A whole um, uh, city of guys were wiped out. Oh, seemed pretty equal. See, revenge. It's over and over in the scriptures. It's over and over in life. It's over and over in our minds. And God says, no, that's not what you should do. In fact, look at the, you know, the golden rule. What does the golden rule say? Matthew 7, 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. If we took that verse on its face, whatever you want others to do to you, do to them, I, we'd probably stop revenge. But Satan has twisted it. Whatever somebody's done to you, you need to go back and do to them. That's the demonic twist of revenge. It's basically taking the golden rule upside down. And it's a fool's gold. Leviticus 19, 17, you shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. Just stop there for a second. In other words, don't hate him in your heart. Speak out what's wrong. Speak out where things have gone off. Let him know. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. This whole idea of revenge. We're going to be doing this peacemaking seminar uh, at the end of the month, and every one of us need to be there because we need to deal with how do we handle conflict? Somebody's hurt me, or offended me, done something wrong, and it may be legitimate, like truly bad. Now, how do I respond as a Christian? Do I stuff it? Because I'm a Christian, I shouldn't get mad, I shouldn't get angry. No, no, no. We just looked at it. It's okay to get angry. But how do I deal with this sense of justice? How do I deal with conflict? What's the biblical way? We'll be talking about that at the end of the month. So, we judge others by their actions, but we judge ourselves by our intentions. I intended to do something good, and because of that, I'm not as bad as the person who didn't do what they said they were going to do. But the same thing on the opposite is, if we have evil in our hearts, we judge ourselves as righteous if we don't act, but we judge others wicked if we perceive their evil intentions. Think about that. I'm righteous because I, even though I was angry and I was mad at you and I wanted to kill you, I didn't. So I'm righteous. But if you have the same thoughts towards me, and I know that you have those same thoughts towards me, you need to pray. You need to get right with God. Isn't it interesting, the double standard that we have? Well, back in Judges, Samson is trying to deal with this, and he's got his revenge going back and forth. Verse 6, then the Philistines said, who has done this? Remember, all the grain had been burned, all their... their their wealth, in a sense, burned in an instance. Who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. Now, this is interesting. How does burning her and the father bring justice? Well, you burn, you know, Samson, your relative now, because he's an in-law, Burned our, our fields, so it's righteous. See, this, this justice going back and forth and the revenge is twisted, and Satan is loving it. But of course, God is using it all for his good, for our good and his glory. Verse 7, and Samson said to them, if this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that, I will quit. I think it's just funny. After that, I'm going to avenge you, I'm going to revenge what you just did, and after that, I'll quit. Verse 8, and he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow, and he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock at Etam. Hip and thigh is another, we would say today, he tore them limb from limb. He basically went and just destroyed the people 
and then he went back to this rock of Etam. Now, just think about the progression here. The Philistines cheat to get to win you in this way, to beat you in this wager about the 30 pairs of clothing. Samson then goes and kills 30 people to fulfill his part of the wager, but afterward he leaves. The father-in-law marries off the daughter, and as a result, Samson's upset, and he goes set fire to all their crops with 300 foxes. The Philistines now burn the father and the wife, and Samson kills the whole bunch, tearing them limb for limb. I'm good now. Whew. Judges 9, 15, verse 9. Then the Philistines came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? They said, We have come up to bind Samson, to do to him as he did to us. Remember, the Philistines are in, in control. They're the government right now. And so they come, they make a raid on Lehi. And this is the area where Samson's hiding out. And they basically are hurting other Israelites. And the Israelites say, hey, 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 we didn't do anything. It wasn't us, it was Samson. Verse 11. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock at Etam and said to Samson, do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you've done to us? And he said to them, as they did to me, so I have done to them. (laughs) Revenge gets so distorted in our eyes. The picture gets so clouded and we feel justified. Because we've been wronged, it's okay for me to do much more wrong. Verse 12. And they said to him, we've come down to bind you that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. They said to him, no, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. Okay, we're just going to bind you. We're not going to kill you. And Samson say, that's fine. I'm good. It's kind of like, I can handle these ropes. No big deal. Verse uh, 14. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. In other words, there's a party. Hey, we finally got Samson. We finally got this guy. Then the spirit of the Lord rushed upon Samson, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey and put out his hand and took it. And with it, he struck 1,000 men. And Samson said, with the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, have I struck down 1,000 men. And as soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramath Lehi, or Jawbone Hill. Samson basically arrests the end. He breaks free. He finds something and grabs this jawbone of a donkey. Now, the donkey was dead, okay? It wasn't a live donkey, in case you were worried. But he grabs the donkey, and oh, oh, it's dead. Is there a problem with Samson grabbing a dead thing? He's using the dead thing. Wait, Samson, you're not supposed to touch the dead thing. You don't need, you got such strength, why do you need a dead thing? But he grabs this donkey's jawbone, and he slays a thousand guys with this donkey. Once again, he's breaking his vow. It's like the vow doesn't really matter, you know? It's like, well, I know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Nazarite. I'm not supposed to touch the dead thing. You know, it's not a big deal. I mean, I'm, re- I'm defending myself. I'm justified. It's okay for me to sin here because of what they did to me there. You ever done that? It's okay for me to do this little bit of thing because what they did was a lot. Verse 18 Samson was very thirsty, and he called upon the Lord and said, you've granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant, and shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? You just see, he's, I mean, killing a thousand people, that's like the ultimate workout. Slash, 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 slash. I mean, he's tired, I understand. But you just see him, you can just hear him whining. God, you did a great miracle, but I am dying of thirst. Can't you send somebody to feed me or give me, see that just the attitude. Once again, the self-righteousness that is just welling up within him. I just did the, I mean, you did it through me. Okay, that's good. He, he recognizes that it was God working through him. That's great. But there's still this whining and complaining that's going on in Samson's heart. And, and this, this, verse, this next verse, honestly, of all the book of Judges, probably amazed me the most. That God doesn't humble him and say, I don't need you, Samson. I could take care of those Philistines with the breath of my mouth. But I used you, yes. Stop whining and complaining. But he doesn't. God, in his mercy, his just mercy, verse 19, God split open the hollow place that is at Lehi, and water came out from it. 
and when he drank, his spirit returned and he revived. Therefore, the name of it was called in Hakor. It is at Lehi this, to, the, to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. So basically, you know, Samson prays, and out of this rock, just the water begins to flow. And there's a spring there today. There's it's a spring that they found or discovered that God opened up. Amazing. Now, here's what's fascinating. That's the end of that chapter. And, and it seems like Samson ruled 20 years. Samson, yeah, you compromised, but Samson was a hero. But remember, the book of Judges is a tragedy. That's not the end of the story. Judges 16.1. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute, and he went into her. The Gazites were told, Samson has come here. And they surrounded the place and set an ambush for him all night at the gate of the city. They kept quiet all night, saying, let us wait till the light of the morning, then we'll kill him. But Samson lay till midnight, and at midnight he arose and took hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts, pulled them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that is in front of Hebron. Now, a couple things. First off, remember, here's Samson. Here he's the judge. He, he's supposed to be, now what does a judge do? They're supposed to judge justly. They're supposed to judge based on the word of God. And what does Samson do? He goes in and he's going to find a prostitute. He's already outside. He's already saying, yeah, the laws are here, but I can do whatever I want because I'm, I'm Samson. That's what's going through his mind. And so he does. He goes into a prostitute um, there in Gaza. And while he's there, he recognizes, you know what? I think they saw me. I better go. But what he does is then he goes and he basically picks up the pillars that are holding up the gate, which, which would be huge. He puts them on his back and carries them up to the top of the hill. He basically, I mean, it, it's a miraculous feat of strength that he does. He takes them up on the top of the hill. And it's once again reminding that God's power is upon him. But also reminding us that it's very easy for us to live here, talk here rather, and live over here. To say one thing and do another. Just as Samson did. We all do that to some extent. Then the next verse. Verse 4. After this, after this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. We all know the story of Delilah. Do you know the story of Sorek? Sorek means grapes. So where does Samson go? Well, I'm not supposed to be hanging out with the grapes, but I'm going to go to the grapes because I think it's a grape idea. And so he hangs out here in the valley of Sorek. In the, he's not supposed to be with the grapes. And yet, once again, remember, that's where the lion came. That's where the, the, uh, the, the honey and all that took place. It was in the vineyard. And here he is. He's once again, he's flirting with temptation. He's like, I can overcome. I, I'm not going to drink any wine. I'm just going to check out the grapes. He's in the valley of the grapes, and he checks out this woman named Delilah, and he's like, she is a delightla to the eyes. And so she, he goes. And the lords of the Philistines, verse 5, came up to her and said to her, seduce him and see where his great strength lies and by what means we may overpower him, that we may bind him to humble him. And we'll give each of you 1,100 peach. We'll each of you, let me read that again, and we will each give you 1,100 pieces of silver. So Delilah said to Samson, please, Tell me where that your strength, your great strength lies and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. Okay, remember the thing we talked about last week. The amazing thing about this verse is when you looked at Samson, you didn't know where his great strength was. If he looked what, like Dwayne the Rock Johnson, you would, you would see like, he's just super strong. He's, he's like totally juiced up, right? But he, Samson didn't look like that. They didn't know where his strength came from. So they're like, find out what's his secret. So... Samson, or Delilah, says, okay, so tell me where your great strength, how did you get so strong, Samson? But notice what she says, and how you might be bound that one could subdue you. There's some stuff going on here. <laughs> and in that, because of his, whatever, fantasies, whatever's going on in his head, he begins to go down this path, not realizing the end is death. There's a way that seems right to a man, and yet it's like, yeah, she's, she's great. She, she meets my every need, so it's okay. We talked a little bit last week about the whole idea of an affair happening. Affairs happen in the heart first, and I'm not getting a need met here. I find a need met over here, 
and I begin drawn. And I may have 10 needs, emotionally, physically, spiritually, whatever, over here that are being met. But if I got two or three needs that aren't being met and I start looking for them over here, those two or three needs may trump the other 10. So what happens is I get drawn and Samson is just getting drawn to this. And as a result, it doesn't matter what I'm sacrificing because this is worth it. How you might be bound. How you might be bound. Satan wants to bind each of us. Samson begins to tell, and he basically strings her along in multiple ways, you'll see. Fresh, bowed, undried bowstrings. He says, well, if you do that, it'll, it'll bind me. And of course, that doesn't work. The next night or the next time, he says, well, new ropes that have never been used. And of course, that doesn't work. Verse 13, twice now Delilah's been fooled. She says to him, you've been making fun of me and telling me lies. Now tell me how you can be tied up securely. Samson replied, if you were to weave the seven braids of my hair into the fabric on your loom and tighten it with the loom shuttle, I would become as weak as anyone else. So while he slept, Delilah wove the seven braids of his hair into the fabric. Okay, notice what's happened. The first two he knew wouldn't work. This third one is dealing with his hair, right? It's this long, he's got seven braids. So apparently he's got some kind of dreads or things going on and he's got seven different things. If you weave that into a loom, then I'll be bound. Now, is this, I want you to think about this. Twice now, he's told her, and she's done it. Now he's like, well, a little bit closer to the truth. Do the weave thing. This is, this is a new take on a hair weave. But do this weave thing, and I'll, be, I'll, I'll become weak. And of course, it doesn't work. So where does that take us? Verse 15. How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times, and you have not told me where your great strength lies. And when she pressed him hard with her words, day after day, and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. And he told her all his heart, and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. <laughs> wow. Three times you've told this woman and three times she did it to you. What do you think is gonna happen next? Now, remember though, God said, don't marry the unbeliever. He did. Nothing happened. God said, don't touch the grapes. He did. Nothing happened. God said, don't touch dead things. Samson did. Nothing happened. Samson is believing the lies. Yeah, you know, you cut my hair, but yeah, I may lose my strength, but maybe I won't. Maybe I won't, because the other ones haven't taken effect yet. You know what? God promised, and God's promises haven't come true. So maybe this one's not going to come true either. And maybe you're there. Maybe you're in a place where God's promises haven't come through. God said this was going to happen and it didn't happen. God said there was going to be a consequence and I didn't get through. Or God said there was going to be a consequence and that person should have paid for it and they got off scot-free. That's not right. And so you don't, you're beginning to doubt. You're holding a grudge because you doubt the judge. Do you believe the promises of God even when they don't come through? Do you believe the promises of God when they're positive and they haven't come through? Here's God's word, and he's saying, this is what's going to happen. And Samson's beginning, he's so twisted, he's so deceived. Remember, as those, as those needs are being met here by this woman named Delilah, he has lost all sense of right and wrong. When you're in that place, you can't see clearly. You know, some people will say, you know, a person, a couple may come and they're living together. And, and they're, you know, the, the word of God says, well, that's sin and you shouldn't do that. And they're like, well, but God understands. And what's happened is with that, with that thing, the, especially the sexual nature of it has so clouded the, the judgment 
in that person's mind that they can't see clearly. And they'll say, well, we'll, we'll, we'll pray about it. Here's the deal. If you're already in that sin, sin blinds you. And so if you're praying about it, you're more likely to believe that God says it's okay because God understands. And by living together, we have two incomes in one household. And so we have more money. And so we can give God more. And God understands. And God wants us to give. And so it'd be better for us to stay together because if we have two households, then we pay less and we wouldn't be able to give as much to the church. And so God understands. There's a purpose. Total wickedness. Total lies. When, when Lori and I got married, actually before Lori and I got married, we had uh, we'd moved to Kansas and um, we were going to get married in December. And I was starting my master's degree and I was trying to find a place to live. Lori had got an apartment and we knew that God didn't want us to live together, right? And so we're like, okay, Lord, we got no money. We're about to get married. We've, we just moved into a place, and I've shared some of you with you the story before of how God provided financially. But we, we prayed. It's like, okay, how are we going to make this work? And God provided an opportunity. So Lori got a roommate at this apartment, and I'm praying, Lord, what do you want me to do? And I found a friend, and I had a day bed. They needed a couch. Hey, if, if you use my day bed as your couch, can you use the day bed by day, and I use the day bed by night? Okay? And that's what I did. I basically had a suitcase I shoved under this day bed. The day bed was their couch. The bed was, the, at, at night, it was my bed. And it was basically, I would come there at night, and I'd sleep. And then the next day, I'd go over to Lori's house, in, in Lori's apartment, and I'd basically be there all day, but um, when I wasn't in school. And then at night, so to avoid temptation, I'd go over here. And so God provided. And this is, this is the amazing thing, is I was paying them $100 a month for them to use my couch. <laughs> I don't know who was the better negotiator there, but I was paying them $100 a month, and my wife was paying her half of the rent was $170 a month. And of course, remember, this is like 30 years ago. It is 30 years ago. We, this December, we'll celebrate 30 years. So, so money was worth more then. Thank you. That's the Lord that she's put up with me for 30 years. So, so she's paying $170. I'm paying $100. Okay, we get married, and we're praying. Okay, Lord... This rent is going up to 340, and there was no way, it sounds so weird to say that, 300, I'd love to have a $340 mortgage. But anyway, the rent was going up to three, actually, I think it was going up to 350, because she was paying half, and it was going up after that anyway. So 350, we were basically paying 170 plus my 100, which was 270. And I was like, we're got it. there's no way we can make the budget work. That extra $80 is like impossible. And we're praying, and we find this apartment that's going to be 275 And we go to the talk to the landlord, and I say, Landlord, what can you do for us? And he said, you know what? I'll give it to you for 270 Which was the exact amount that we were just paying. Remember? $100 here and $170 here. Only now we had our own place, 700-square-foot apartment. Thank you, Jesus, providing for our needs because we chose to not live together. We had family members to say, just, you know what, go to the justice of the peace. And if you feel like you got to do something, go do, do the justice of the peace thing, and you can go have a, a regular wedding later. And we're like, that, no, I don't, that doesn't honor God. We want to follow God's word. And, and I, it, it, you know, it may be right in your eyes for us to do that, but no. Yeah, it would have been a lot easier, and it would have been a lot more fun to do that, but, <laughs> but No. And that's the problem, is that if, if we had started down that road, it, it becomes cloudier and cloudier, and the judgment is hard to cl see clearly. 1 John 2, verse 11, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. There's talking about judgment and revenge, which is part of what our message is about, but also here about the whole sexual nature. When we begin to walk in darkness, when we begin to walk in compromise, it blinds us. Sin blinds. The more you walk in darkness, the more blind you are to sin. So you can't pray about sin. Sin blinds. If God's word says stop, stop. Don't pray about what God says. If God's already told you, then stop. Because otherwise... 1 John 1, 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. See, that's the problem. When you pray about a sin, if you know that God's word says this is a sin, and you pray about it, what you're really saying is, I'm not sure it's sin. Not sure. I think God understands divorce. I think God understands. I think God understands revenge. I think God understands my 
my addiction. I think God understands this and all these things. And if you do that, if you say that God understands, you're basically saying, I have no sin. It's really not a big deal to God. And if you say you have no sin, you deceive yourself. And truth is not in you. We must agree with God that we've sinned, repent of the sin, turn away, turn around, go the other direction. But in our own eyes, what's right in our own eyes, it doesn't seem so bad. Well, Samson, verse, six, uh, verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, he sent and called the lords of the Philistines saying, come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. She made him sleep on her knees and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And then she began to torment him and his strength left him. Ouch. And she said, the Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and said, I will go out as the other times and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. Probably the saddest verse in this book of Judges. The Lord had left. I thought God never leaves us. In this supernatural, physical sense, that the strength that he had. Yeah, God leaves us. God said, I'm not sticking around for this. You've compromised every area. I've given you grace, 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 grace. At some point, the grace of God is exhausted, and he says, there's going to be justice. The Philistines seized him and gouged out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza and bound him with bronze shackles, and he ground the mill in the prison. Samson's sin was he did what was right in his own eyes. Samson's sin was that he was engaged with the lust of the eyes, and so the judgment of God was that he lost his eyes. Matthew 5, 27. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery, Samson. But I say to you, church, that everyone who looks at a woman with lust, lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it's better that you lose one of the members and that your whole body go to hell. There's some ways in which Samson's judgment, losing his eyes, was a grace of God. The eyes were his temptation. And God is saying, I'm going to strip you of those because you, can't, you don't have the self-control. God is telling us, if you're struggling with this and you're struggling with self-control, remember, cutting off your hand, cutting the, the fingernails doesn't work. If it's the eye that's bothering you, you've got to pluck it out. Not physically remove your eyes like Samson, but literally whatever it is. If, you're, if your problem is pornography and it's on the web or it's on your phone, then you've got to somehow remove it from your phone. Remove your phone. Go to a flip phone. Go to a phone that can't, can't do the pictures. Or do, some kind of, do something to say to God, I'm serious about this and I'm going to cut it off. I'm going to remove it, whatever it is. If your if you're sin, you, know, you, you fill in the blank with whatever it is, that addiction, whatever it is, that stronghold that's holding you captive, that idol that you bow down to, you have to crush it and sacrifice it and get rid of it. Otherwise, it continues to exercise control. Well, as he's there, after a while, his hair begins to grow back. Verse 23 then the lords of the Philistines gathered to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to rejoice. They said, our God has given Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, our God has given our enemy into our hand, the ravager of our country, who has killed many of us. And when their hearts were merry, they said, call Samson that he may entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison, and he entertained them. They made him stand between the pillars. Basically, they could have killed Samson and be done with it. But there was something about their sense of justice is, no, we want to torment you. We want to humiliate you. It isn't enough to kill you. To kill you is too easy. So we're going to torture you. And not knowing that, once again, going beyond just justice is going to cause their own problems. Verse 28, Samson called to the Lord, O Lord God, please remember me and strength, please strengthen me only this once, O God, that I may be avenged on the Philistines for my two eyes. Now, just stop there for a second. All the things that have gone wrong in Samson's life. And what is he upset about? I've lost my eyes. God, help me get them back because they took my eyes. I don't really see repentance. I don't see a heart that's turned to God. I don't see a heart that says, God, I did wrong. God, I'm sorry that I forsook. You gave me an incredible gift and I used it for my own. I don't see that. 
Instead, I just see a guy that says, they did me wrong. God, for what they did to me, let me take them out. And there's 3,000 of them. Of course, he pushes on the parts of the the two pillars. The whole thing comes crashing down. He says, take my life. And this is a whole crazy prayer. It's a suicide prayer. Is that that, that what God wanted? Is that the way God wanted Samson to end? Think about it. God had gifted this guy with supernatural strength to be a judge, to be a deliverer, to begin the deliverance of Israel from the Philistines. But God has this perfect will, his permissive will. He basically says, okay, this is what I'd really like. We don't know what God originally intended. That God may have actually intended Samson to do it completely different and completely set them free from the Philistines. Remember that Samson is the only one who ever fights the Philistines in the story of Samson. Samson doesn't lead any armies. What had, he, what had happened if he'd led an army? They probably could have wiped out all of the Philistines completely. This is what they were supposed to do. But instead, Samson was all about him. It's all about himself. Samson's revenge. God, God uses it. 3,000 Philistines die. Samson dies. And they come, the family come and collect his body. What does God say? To wrap up, Romans 12, 17. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. Fear, dear dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. We are called as believers to do something different. We're called to look at the situation different. When somebody has wronged us, yes, it's righteous to be angry, but not stand in that anger. It's righteous to look at and recognize the situation and say, that was wrong. Jesus goes on in Matthew 5, 38. You know, you've heard that said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who's evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to the, the other also. If anyone would sue you to take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. Verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who's in heaven. The gospel basically says that God is just and God is the one who's gonna bring revenge. He's gonna bring justice and it's not gonna be this get even revenge. His way of bringing justice, it looks like this. This picture. God's justice. Every sin will be paid for on the cross or in hell. So those things that people did wrong to you, Jesus is suffering for those things that they did wrong to you. Did he suffer enough or should he suffer some more for what they, for what they did? Was this not enough? But it doesn't make me feel any better. It's because you're not looking at your own sin. If you stop and you look at your own sin, the weight of your own sin, what they did to you was wrong. And it's right to say what they did was wrong. But it's wrong for you to continue to hold it and say, I'm not going to forgive when the price has been paid. Now, here's the deal. If that person never receives Christ, they are going to go to hell and they are going to suffer for eternity for their sins, which includes what they did to you. But if they turn to Christ, Jesus' suffering on the cross was enough. But if you're having a hard time forgiving somebody, then you're saying that's not enough. It's not enough. To close our service, three application questions. Who do you need to forgive? We all need to forgive somebody. There's always somebody. And sometimes the forgiveness is is like an onion. You've got to peel one layer and say, I forgive this person. Recognizing here's the onion, here's that layer. But in your left hand, you still got some stuff. And you may not be able to deal with this right now. You may not even realize you've got some stuff here, but there's going to be another layer. And depending on the grievance, depending on the sin that was done, it may take a while to continue to peel. But you're, as a believer in Jesus, it's saying, Jesus is enough. I, by faith, am peeling off another layer of that onion and giving it to God. 
one of my kids this week, um, last year it had a rough year and with the teachers was angry and upset and felt like they were doing, they were showing favorites and he wasn't one of the favorites and going back and forth. And, um, um, <laughs> he's at one point he said, you know, he was, he was just, you could just see the anger and just bitterness. And this week he was doing a, a little Bible study and he's got done with the Bible study and he, he prayed to forgive his teachers. And his testimony was, and I just felt so lighter. That's what forgiveness is. Forgiveness is saying, I don't need to carry those wrongs against me because you know what? I release them. Forgiving, I'm, I'm not saying that they weren't wrong. I'm just saying, I don't need to have them paid for somebody else. Jesus has paid for them. So who do you need to forgive? Do you see other sins against you as worse than your sins against God? And therefore, Christ's death is not enough. And are you walking in darkness in some area like Samson was, and so that you're spiritually blind and you need to repent. What's going on there? Let's pray. God, thank you for grace. Your amazing grace. We don't deserve it. We don't earn it. And still you continue to give yourself away. You continue to give us mercy. You give us grace. Mercies that are new every morning. God, may we not take those for granted. And Lord, may you help us to extend that same forgiveness to others. Not to say that what they did was right or that it had no impact or it had no effect, but instead to agree that your suffering, your death on the cross was enough. Give us the faith to trust you. In Jesus' name. Amen.